Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God our Heavenly Father to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For 
the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. A reading from Exodus. The Israelites had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice, and keep my commandment, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Here ends the lesson. Canticle number nine. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my savior. Therefore you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. And on that day you shall say, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things, and this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion, ring out your joy, for the great one in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Here ends the lesson. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. For behold, darkness covers the land, deep gloom and shrouds the peoples. But over you the Lord will rise, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will stream to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawning. Your gates will always be open, by day or night they will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction will 
Sisters and brothers, may the Lord give you peace. One of my all-time favorite books is entitled Brother to a Dragonfly. It's autobiographical, written by the late Will Campbell, preacher, storyteller, civil rights activist, and one of America's great folk theologians. In the story, he tells of himself, he speaks about his first call. Fresh out of the Yale Divinity School, he was sent down to a small Baptist church in Louisiana. There was another Baptist church in the community, much larger and more prominent, and the pastor of that church was someone who Will found most fascinating, a man named Thad Garner. And what fascinated Will Campbell about this man was he didn't exactly fit the stereotype of what he thought Baptist preachers should be. He said Thad would cuss a lot, drink a lot, even though he had just one kidney. He would hold these large revivals, but only to raise money. He had a great youth program, but he really didn't like kids or youth. And when his church took up a love offering to send him to the Holy Land, People were persuaded that the slides he would show were slides he probably purchased at the Tel Aviv airport. Will said he could not understand this most unlikely of Southern Baptist preachers. So one day Will invited him to go hunting with him. And as they were out there together and Will was looking, as Thad was looking down on the barrel of his gun, Will Campbell looked at him and said, Thad, why did you ever become a Baptist preacher? And he writes that Thad seemed rather hurt by that question. And he looked at him kind of sadly, and then he said, why? Because I was called, you gall darn fool, I was called. Will says he never met someone who believed so little, preached with such certainty, and was absolutely persuaded that he was doing exactly what God needed him to do. He would also go on to talk about some very, very fine things that Thad Garner did in his rather iconoclastic way, such as bringing peace to a serious labor dispute. Whenever I think about this story, I recall how the great Reinhold Niebuhr said, not referring to holy orders, but referring to gifts within the church, that God needs in the church people with priestly souls to serve it, people with prophetic souls to challenge it, and from time to time, those iconoclasts that just seem to be beholden to no one. And, of course, I think about that story of Thad Garner, and I think, yep, that's one of those iconoclasts. And I oftentimes think how it is that God calls unlikely people to do great things. We have Gideon. Gideon says, I can't raise up an army. I am the least member of the least tribe of Israel. And then we have Amos, but I'm just a dresser of sycamore trees. We have Jeremiah, I'm far too young to go out and be a prophet. And then there's Paul, he persecutes the church. He does everything he can do to destroy it, and yet he gets called to go and minister among the Gentiles. And today we have the calling of the 12. And these are not exactly people whose credentials or background would seem to make them suited to be proclaiming the good news. We know at least four of them were fisher people. We know one was a tax collector, and to be a tax collector was a very dishonorable thing for a Jew to do. We know there was at least one who was a carpenter, that was James, the son of Alphaeus, or James the Less, which means the younger. And in fact, save for Thomas, none of the 12 had any formal training in what we would call scripture or theology. 
Sometimes when I think about the unlikeliness of our calls, I said this many times. When I'm doing something or in a place where I don't really want to be or don't feel particularly qualified to be, I discover that's exactly where God needs me to be. So when I think about Will's story about Thad, it does remind me of how God calls oftentimes the unlikely, puts them in unlikely situations, but still gives the grace necessary for them to be faithful servants. But there's another dimension to this story that came to me when I was rereading it in preparation to preach last fall for the celebration of new ministry of a former colleague of mine. And it was Will's choice of the word to preach with certainty. Strange as it may be that somebody is out of place and would appear as a Thad Garner, would be an instrument of God's salvation, but he was absolutely certain that he was doing precisely what God wanted and needed him to do. And that certainty is a critical part of our understanding what it means to be called. And being called is not just limited to ordained people, quite the opposite. Call is the things that come to us when God is asking us to do things, whether it's to sing or to serve in a vestry or to be a part of a committee or take on a ministry or whatever, that's a call. And calls need to be done and exercised in a way that we truly believe that this is what God wants us to do, needs us to do. When I was ordained to the diaconate in 1976, the late Bernard Dozier, the great biblical teacher, said to the six of us who were gathered, you are here today because you could be nowhere else. And then she gave this absolutely beautiful image when she said, all of you have been hounded by the hound of heaven. And Jesus is calling the 12 to go out and serve and not only to serve, but to serve as holy people. Just as God is charging Israel, as we heard in the Old Testament lesson, to be a priestly kingdom, a holy nation. The kingdom of heaven has grown near, and now I am sending you, the twelve, to go out and serve. The great philosopher, sometimes called the philosopher of the heart, Soren Kierkegaard, when he speaks of the heart, is not speaking so much of the biology, but where is your passion? Where is it that you believe you truly are a part of a priestly kingdom, a holy nation, a holy church, have a holy call? One of the things we must claim and reclaim over and over again is that we as a church have been called to be instruments of God's salvation. And we must put more energy and emphasis on the grace of God doing what God will do and less on ourselves, either in a self-righteous way or feeling, woe is me, I feel so inadequate. During this pandemic, it's been noted that houses of worship, interestingly enough, are becoming very popular. How do we know this? We look at the number of hits that we see coming through the social media whether it's through the YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or whatever. I was talking with my neighbor who attends Beth Tefillah Synagogue, and he was saying, we're just amazed at the number of people who are going online all week long to find out what we're doing. And then I said, well, you know, I hear the same thing at St. David's, where I worship. We are getting more people checking in with us than we possibly could imagine. Why? because people are interested in knowing what ultimately counts, what matters. We are turning to houses of worship because we do want to hear what God is telling us to do and how to be safe and calm and be sustained through this pandemic. Jesus teaches his disciples as he sends them out. And if we look at the scripture story, that's what it is. He sends them out first, and then as they go through their journeys, he teaches them many things, but it isn't a question of waiting until they're fully prepared. It's going forth. 
And you know, some of the time our calls are fairly traditional. Maybe we have that priestly service. And sometimes maybe it's that prophetic service. And frankly, we all know and appreciate those iconoclasts who somehow just don't seem to fit, but something about them is holy. Being called, I think also involves each of us realizing those times in our life when we do believe God has been with us, pushed us, shoved us, whatever it is, into something. When I look at my own call for the ordained ministry, it's not one single event, but an absolutely key event occurred for me in 1963. I was walking back to our living quarters from a football game, and a group of protesters were gathering to protest the murder of those five girls at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. I didn't really plan to be there, but something said to me, you can't be anyplace else. You can't be anyplace else. And I look back on that and I realize throughout my ministry, two things have been critical to me. One is to work for racial equality and the other is to work against anti-Semitism. So I've pretty much concluded God's not finished with me yet because I still feel those calls are just as valid today as they ever were. What we need to understand, my sisters and brothers, is that we must be passionate in our service to God and to God's church. We are talking about measured achievement. We're not even talking about success. By all earthly criteria, the Thad Garner that I mentioned early in my sermon wouldn't fit, but we talk about faithfulness. We are called not to be successful, but to be faithful. And what's amazing about it all is when we are fully faithful, no matter how strange or different it may feel to us and to others, God's grace is abounding. We are all called, all of St. David's. We are called in our music, in our worship, in our outreach, in our formation, in our pastoring. We are called. You're darn right, we've been called because God has a great need for St. David's, just as God has the need for Israel to be the holy nation, the priestly kingdom, and for the 12 who were sent out for healing and proclaiming. We, my sisters and brothers, have been called. We have been called. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. In the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Day by day, we bless you. Lord, keep us from all sin today. 
Lord, show us your love and mercy. In you, Lord, is our hope. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. The tyrants draw nigh. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Let us pray for people in our community and throughout the world. O God, the strength of the weak and the comfort of sufferers, mercifully accept our prayers and grant to your servants commended to our prayers the help of your power. Liz Ackerman, Tina Baker, Jennifer Barnes, Chris Butler, Charlotte Collins, Sina Cook, Holly Cox, Bill Cranick, James Crum, Bill Dixon, Theron Dunn, Jeff and Kathy Eyring, Hazel Gentry, Carolina Green, Michael Harlan, Chris, Fred Hinder, Catherine Hogue, Charles Johnson, Segrin Kep, Finn Lake Goldstein, Brendan, Penny Marshall, Ellen Maxwell, Harold McRae, Dan McIntyre, Sandy Malone, Norma Mackinall, Linda, Fran Ober, 
Angie Ortez, Dottie Pratt, Deirdre Russo, Benicio Sachs Ortiz, Dan Sapp, Stephen Scradonis, Sam Snatchko, Norris Wong, Carl, Anja, Frank, Mary, Morgan, Jen, Hannah, and those we name at this time. May their sickness be turned into health and our sorrow into joy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God of compassion, giver of life and health, we pray your healing mercies upon all who are in any way affected by the outbreak of the COVID-19 coronavirus. Comfort and sustain those who have been stricken relieve their pain and restore to them your gifts of gladness and strength. Grant to all in authority the courage to make wise decisions that are essential for the common good and strengthen them to lead institutions that care for those whom they serve. Strengthen doctors and other medical professionals who must make difficult decisions regarding ventilators and other treatments, that their discernment be just and compassionate and that all efforts be made to ensure that all of God's people have healing. Bless all hospital workers, nurses, and first responders who are on the front line of treatment, bringing the fullness of your healing to those who treat and care for the sick and those at risk. Protect all service and maintenance workers who keep our hospitals and health care facilities clean and safe. Guard from all danger those who work for the common good and strengthen them in the knowledge that it is through their sacrifice and service that the health of the whole community is promoted. Mercifully accept these our prayers, O God of all comfort, and our only help in time of need. Amen. We pray to you for those we love but see no longer. Grant them your peace, let light perpetual shine upon them, and in your loving wisdom and almighty power, work in them the good purpose of your perfect will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we commend to your gracious care and keeping all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad, especially Joe Chilbert, Alfred Cianfrano, Jared and Bree Dorsey, Jasmine Dorsey, Miguel Ferrer, Richard Hagner, Matt Hamaker, Bob Hine, Matt Hine, Chris Hine, Jonathan Jurgensen, J.D. Kameen, Xavier Reynolds, Armand Reynolds, Patrick Shanley, and those we name at this time. Defend them day by day with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and temptations. Give them courage to face the perils which beset them and grant them a sense of your abiding presence wherever they may be. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants celebrating birthdays in the coming week, especially Brian Gifford, Ruth Dingle, Hannah Goki, Addie McMurray, Ian Thomas, Janie McLaughlin, and Logan Wilson. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen them to trust in your goodness all the days of their lives, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We give thanks today for the Von Holland family in whose name the altar flowers are given by Dr. and Mrs. Aristides C. Alvizatos. Please join me in praying together a prayer attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light where there is sadness, joy. 
Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you, and you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. Grace for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with loving zeal, the poor and them that mourn, the faint and overborn, sin sick and sorrow-worn, whom Christ doth We 